Today in this video, we'll be discussing five compositional techniques that I love using in my photos. Composition is one of the most important aspects of photography as it determines how your viewers perceive and engage with your images. It refers to the way in which elements in your photograph are arranged and framed. It ranges from choosing a point of view, determining the placement of subjects, selecting a focal point, and deciding on the overall structure of the image. Essentially, composition is a very important piece to any great photo. So let's go ahead and jump right in, starting with the first technique. This is probably one technique you've heard of before, but personally, I love using frames in my photos. You're able to bring more attention to your subject by putting them in a frame. It gets more interesting the more creative you're able to be, which for this technique, it's endless because essentially, your environment is your playground. Let's jump into some examples to show you what I mean. This picture right here was in downtown LA at night during the winter, probably around 7 p.m. or so. For this picture, I noticed this man standing right here under the light and got the idea of getting some kind of photo of him. He wasn't moving much, if at all, so I knew I had the time to get a photo. I noticed some buses coming by and since I had been doing long exposures throughout that night, it immediately clicked my head that I might be able to frame him with the bus window as it passed by. I tried for maybe 5-10 minutes or so and I was able to get this shot that I was pretty happy with. For this photo, it was in San Pedro at the Korean Friendship Bell. This place is known exactly for what the name says, the Korean Friendship Bell. But the basketball courts there are pretty popular as well, being that they're right next to the ocean. With this photo, I'd been walking around getting photos of the bell, when I noticed the courts were finally empty. I'd been wanting to just walk on the court since I love basketball as well, and the courts were built. After, I saw this group of friends just watching the ocean, and I had the idea of getting this basketball court right here to frame them with the sun backlighting them. I also try to get them as evenly spaced as possible, as you can see right here, by waiting and moving myself to align all the elements together. And thankfully, it turned out to be an image I'm proud of. When we view a scene with our own two eyes, we see it in 3D. However, our cameras don't. They produce 2D images. That's why when we take certain shots, they appear flat, and they don't have that pop to them that you might have seen when you were on scene. What can we do then if our cameras capture scenes in 2D? Well, we have to use some techniques to add the 3D element back into our photograph. And we can do that by simply creating depth in our images. There are a handful of techniques we can use to do that. One way I like to do that is with lighting. The way light hits our scene can drastically change how it looks when we take the shot. There are three types of lightings, front lighting, side lighting, and back lighting. Frontal lighting results in a flat picture, so we won't be talking about that. Instead, let's focus on side lighting and back lighting. Side lighting is my favorite to use to show depth, as you can really see the details of everything in your photo due to the unevenness of the light hitting everything, and it adds contrast as well. And in general, it's just very pleasing to look at. With back lighting, we take side lighting to the next level as we introduce even more contrast to the picture, since the camera is pointed directly into the source of light. Let's take a look at some examples of both side lighting and back lighting. In this scene, the sun was coming from this direction right here. And since it was late afternoon, the sun was a bit more down and not as harsh compared to high noon. When photographing, I always try to place myself in a position where the sun is hitting my subject from the side or the back. So that's exactly what I did in this picture right here. Then I just composed the photo to include all the elements I wanted, which were the red brick warehouse right here as my main subject, some of the buildings in the Yokohama skyline to supplement the red brick warehouse, and a bit of this wall right here in this foreground, which I will talk about more in this video. But with the lighting hitting the objects in this photo, you can really see the detail in some of these objects and the buildings, which overall give this photo more of a 3D feel. Another way to create depth is using foreground elements. This allows your photo to appear more 3D by adding layers to your image rather than just being flat. The different layers go as such, foreground being the closest, middle ground being the middle area, and background being whatever backdrop is in your image. Here are some examples to further explain this concept. For this picture, we are at Hermosa Beach. It was a very foggy day when I was expecting to see a beautiful sunrise, so this was a bummer at first, but it ended up being a very good photo walk. But anyways, in this photo, we had the foreground right here, the middle ground right here being where I put focus on, and then the background where the bridge extends all the way deeper into the ocean. These leading lines really help create depth in your image because of exactly the reasons we talked about before. It creates layers in the photo. With this photo, I took it during my walk around the National Art Center, which is this building right here in the back. I love the juxtaposition of the scene, with the nature of all these trees and the beautiful colors, with the infrastructure of this building right here, as well as the sign. With this particular composition, I set my aperture to f8 to try and get everything in focus, and for the most part, it was. Then it was all a matter of getting this picture to have the most depth as possible, which I did by adding layers to the image, by using this sign and these plants as foreground, this 
portion right here with the red plants and these other green plants as middle ground, and then this infrastructure, this building right here as the background. The lighting also helps depth as well, which made me very satisfied with this photo. The one thing I wish I could have done was remove these people right here from the image as I didn't want anyone in the frame, but it was impossible during that day as there were so many people, but that's another story for another day. When taking photos, we typically have a subject in mind, but the more busier your scene is, the more easily we can confuse our viewers. Their eyes might go all around the picture, missing the most important part and the main focus of your photo. We don't want that. One way we can do that is ensuring our subject is separated from the background. There are many ways to do this, but I'll only be discussing this method. For this method, we place our subject in areas that are easily separated from the background, which will make it easier to stand out amongst all the other elements in our photo. We want our subject to be noticeable very quickly. But this doesn't just stop at subject separation. This can go for other important elements in your photo. We can take a look at these photos to further explain this concept. So this was taken in Shinjuku, where it gets pretty busy, especially at night. These panning long exposure type of shots are popular to take for a couple reasons. Number one, they produce really cool shots. I mean, like you can't really, you can't really go wrong with these type of shots when you get it right. They just look really cool. And number two, it makes it easy to distinguish your subject as you're essentially separating your subject from everything else. And in this picture particularly, the car's background being the bright lights of the buildings right here, really separate the car even more from the background as it contrasts with it, making it stand out way more. If the car were blue or orange, maybe it might have not been as standout as it was. For these next two photos, I use the separation as means to make my secondary subject, or the second most important thing in my photo, more stand out, as opposed to the main subject. In this first photo, I wanted to make the building right here the first thing you see, via the light, as their eyes are attracted to the brightest part of the image, and size. It's the biggest thing in the picture. But in order to do that, I had to make sure they also stood out. When composing my photo before these people got here, I had the idea of getting low near this rail right here to get to more depth in my photo. But as these two made their way towards the river, I quickly had to adjust the height of where my camera was because I wanted to make sure that their heads weren't going to blend into the space of the tower or this building right here. So I wanted to separate them from the background by having them positioned right here where the light hits the river so we can notice them more quickly. But because this photo is like this, their entire figure is visible. As opposed to if I took this maybe a bit lower, their head may have blended in with this portion of the picture right here, which would have made them not as visible or just look weird in general in the photo. This is the same technique I applied to this photo I took in Santa Monica as well. I wanted to showcase the Ferris wheel at night right here, since it's one of the nice things on the pier. Before taking the picture, I knew they had a roller coaster ride that goes around the wheel, and I wanted to showcase that as well right here. Because it was night though, they would have blended in with the background of taking anywhere else, like right here or right here. So in order to show everyone riding the roller coaster, I had to wait for them to be right in front of the Ferris wheel right here. This would backlight them and give them a silhouette look, separating them from the background. This was needed as if taken at a different time during the roller coaster ride, they would have blended into the night sky and you probably wouldn't even notice that there was a ride in the first place. I talked about my 55mm 1.8 lens in my other video, and I mentioned how it's one of my favorite lenses to use. Which by the way, check it out if you haven't. With the 50mm lens, you're able to comfortably get candid shots from a distance where you don't have to be right in the action. This can be great for anyone who isn't quite comfortable yet getting close to the subjects. Though another big reason why I like shooting street with telephoto lenses is the compression you can get in those shots. For those who aren't sure what I mean by compression, it's the compression of the scene making the background, foreground, and mid-ground appear much closer together than they actually are. The higher the focal length, the more compression you get in your shots. Which brings me to another focal length I love shooting with, the 85mm. I love how different of a look you can get with an 85mm versus other focal lengths. Since it's not a very common focal length for street photography, that automatically makes your work stand out even more. But even when using such tight focal lengths, I still like to capture the scenery and area I'm in to use that as a backdrop or just to add context and story to the photo. This might be a bit troublesome though, since telephoto lenses like the 85mm can be very tight, so you definitely have to back up quite a bit. But I love getting these types of shots as well as the challenge that comes with it. Hopefully with these five tips, you can go out and start getting creative with your environment and seeing improvements in your photography. There are tons of more techniques out there and skills you can learn, so I would highly recommend you go out there and search for those other tools so you can have more in your bag to express what you want in your photography. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave me a message below. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit that like button as well. That'll be all for me this week. I'll see you in the next. Later.